not true, say Tom Woods and Damon Root. Woods is the author of 33 questions about American history you're not supposed to ask. Damon Root writes for Reason Magazine. Both have studied history and were shocked at how much of what they learned in school turned out to be wrong. Like what? Well, the union question for one. I mean, what do we get on unions other than propaganda? And I say this as a well, son they of a teacher. Raised, they, they raised us all up with all these rules. Well, if, if the union mythology were correct, history wouldn't have turned out the way it did. So from roughly the Civil War up through 1900, wages are rising consistently, and yet 3% of the labor force was unionized. So obviously the unions can't take credit for this. American workers got the eight-hour day much sooner than the, their much more heavily unionized counterparts in Europe did. They had higher wages. So, but the unions say they got the eight-hour day only because of unions. Well, th this is not correct, and for, for reasons that we'll get to when we talk about workplace safety. I think about my own father's case. Now, my father was a teamster, but he drove a forklift for a living for 15 years. Now, imagine if he had had to stack pallets with his bare hands instead of with a forklift. How much could they possibly have paid him? A dollar fifty? But it's because of the capitalist act of saving and investing in equipment that makes my father more productive that makes it even plausible that he could earn a decent wage. And you're saying union rules might have prevented the introduction of the forklift? Well, sure. I mean, either through feather bedding or work rules or through the taxes on corporations that most of these unions seem to want to favor, that would have, would have prevented this healthy outcome from occurring. And Damon, they, the unions say they, they made the workplace safer? Well, unions claim credit for a lot of things. One of the things they also say is that they've been this unalloyed force for good, a progressive, wonderful force in American history. When, in fact, if you look at the actual history of organized labor, it, it, their success, their rise to power, came at the expense of disadvantaged groups, particularly African Americans, as you mentioned in the beginning. The 1935, the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, they call it the Magna Carta of Labor, originally contained a clause forbidding unions from discriminating against uh, black members, and that was taken out at the insistence of the American Federation of Labor. So this idea that unions have been this wonderful force for racial equality is, is simply wrong. And the AFL's president, in support of the bill, lamented colored labor is being sought to demoralize wage rates. The, the unions pushed for something called the Davis-Bacon Act in 1931, which Herbert Hoover signed. Which we're still stuck with. We're still stuck with today. And the Davis-Bacon Act was in response. In Long Island, there was a veterans hospital being built, and the uh, contractor brought in a group of black construction workers from the South, and the unions freaked out about this. They said, this is colored labor. It's depressing the white man's working wage. They went to their representative, Bacon, uh, here in New York, he, and he got this bill passed. And what this does is it sets wages. It's called the prevailing wage. It's the local union. Union wage. So if you're a black person, unions are discriminatory. They're racist. They won't let you in or they, they, they treat you badly. What you can do to compete is you can Start work your own business. You could, which you could also work for a, a lower wage. And that's what many African Americans did at the time. And the Davis Bacon Act goes into effect. And now it's illegal for them to compete against organized labor on federal projects. The safer workplace question. Well, that sounds superficially plausible, right? I mean, there are wicked capitalists who want, you know, steel beams falling on your head and thankfully we the don't unions care intervene. The right, yeah, they couldn't care less. But the, the, the long and the short of it is, if we were to introduce American safety standards into Bangladesh right now, would that turn Bangladesh into a utopia or would it throw it would everyone safer, out of work? It would be safer, say the unions. Yeah, because no one would be working. They'd all be sitting in their huts doing nothing. The, it shows that there is a limit to workplace safety. And that limit is the wealth of the society. And as the society becomes wealthier, as we invest in more capital equipment, as the workers become more productive and their wages increase, they can begin to opt for taking some of that increased wage in the form of safer workplaces. And as we've seen, government tries to take credit for all these advances when the wealth that the market creates is what makes it possible. Without that, we would all be in Bangladesh. And a good example of that is OSHA. The head of OSHA under President Clinton was fond of holding up this chart that showed how workplace injuries had steadily dropped since OSHA began. But then somebody charted it before OSHA and found it was dropping at the same rate. The slope of the line is the same. Things get better because of free markets. 
Right, and they create more wealth and make it possible for us to opt for safer workplace environments. And in fact, most workplace injuries are caused either by people getting in traffic fatalities on the highways or another, another worker punches you in the face. It's not what most people think is that, you know, you're sitting there and, you know, you get, your leg gets caught in the grinder and we're eating sausages made out of some guy's leg. That is not what most of them are caused by. I'm relieved to hear that because uh, I eat sausage. Uh, let's move on to another myth, the New Deal. FDR's New Deal solved the Great Depression. I think most people think that. We had a depression, he spent all this money, all these programs, lifted us out. Well, I don't blame them for thinking that. It's the propaganda that's shoved down their throats 24 hours a day, present company accepted, of course. So uh, the answer to this is just to look to his own people. I mean, look at Henry Morgenthau, who was his Treasury Secretary, said in 1939, after he had just seen the unemployment statistics, showing unemployment at just about 20%, said, well, we've done everything that the experts told he us said, to do. We have tried spending money. We are spending more than we have ever spent before, and it does not work. And so it turns out that we still get double-digit unemployment during the 30s. We have numerous years where net capital investment is negative. We've got what's called regime uncertainty, because a lot of businessmen wonder, with an administration like this, I don't want to risk my capital right now, so I'm going to hold back from investing. We've got this, this well, are you, view. Are, are you talking Roosevelt or Obama now? Yeah, see, there you go, because that's the real parallel here. And yet today, FDR gets the credit for solving the Depression? It's, it's astonishing that he would get this credit. And the, the record, as I say, with his own people uh, pointing out that it's been a failure, what, what more would it require for us to concede this? Let's move on to, you made a comment about Hoover did nothing and then Roosevelt saved us. Hoover didn't do nothing. Hoover increased spending. Hoover is the opposite of laissez-faire. Hoover, he doubles government spending. There's a public work spending spree. The, what we call the Hoover Dam, which, which was completed under FDR but was started under Hoover. Hoover creates the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which essentially is giving bailouts to banks and to government projects. We have this graph of spending under Hoover and before Hoover. It had been pretty flat for the years before Hoover. Hoover comes to power, that's the yellow, he increases spending 50%. This idea that he's laissez-faire, just absurd. And you mentioned the Hoover Dam, um, that's a good example. Uh, it was a big stimulus product project and of course it was done under him, it's the Hoover Dam. And even today it's still celebrated by advocates of big spending as an example of the wonderful things government should do. It's a project of national significance. We've got those projects on the menu right now. And we've got to figure out whether or not we are still a country that can think this big. And I think they're winning in the marketplace of ideas, the advocates of big spending. They, they, most people think economies won't take care of themselves. Government has to control it. And yet, here we have the greatest examples of, of the opposite, with the Great Depression and the current situation. I mean, for somebody to think that this was caused by the free market, when you have Fannie and Freddie, you have all these regulations, you have the Federal Reserve pumping the system with, with cheap credit, making it seem like the best thing you can do is buy five investment properties, interest only, and have no job. You know, that's not the free market at work. That's crony capitalism at its, at its worst. Thank you, Tom Woods, Damon Root. The election season's underway, and so now we're going to get those ugly, nasty campaigns.